Steelers. Pittsburgh do this all the time. I've been playing them for 13 years. When you aboard the middle, they're going to the middle. It's never changed. And welcome back to the ninth episode of the Steel City Sermon, presented to you by Blitzalytics.com. I'm your host, Mr. Roy Countryman, and on Twitter, at PreacherBoyRoy, and our show's Twitter, of course, at Steel City Sermon. What a disappointing time to be a Steeler fan. I know we uh, missed the playoffs here. We've had a couple of weeks of, of great action in the playoffs, and the team that ultimately beat us out for that uh, sixth, sixth wild card position is looking pretty formidable here to maybe a Super Bowl run. But we're going to go ahead and get this kicked off right with our prelude here, and we're going to jump into that last game that the Steelers, uh, how do I put it? sorry performance that they put out there against Baltimore, and you can kind of see and read the tea leaves as it was coming uh, the night before. There was really three strikes uh, against them, and it was and it was game over for us in our season. So they did miss the playoffs. We did face off against the Ravens and mostly their second strings. Um, but as I was previewing this, you guys can maybe remember my preview. I did predict that the Ravens were going to beat us. Um, I just had that feeling that we weren't going to beat them and they were on a mission to to make the playoffs and go on a deep run. Unfortunately for them, uh, that was an early exit uh, in the playoffs after their performance here against the Titans. Um, but the three variables that really came at stake here was the mindset the Ravens really put forth. I, I mentioned it in my preview about Michael Pierce talking about that if if the one of his teammates were weren't taking this um, serious against the Steelers, that they needed to come talk to him. And then you even had... Um, after the game, Jimmy Smith making a comment saying, we definitely had to win this game. It means a lot to us to be 14-2 and this year. And he he ended his whole statement by saying, it's a Steelers game too. It's not the Titans or something. So, you know, it's 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 personal anytime them two get together and face off. And, and it just had a little bit more gusto to it, even though um, you could tell the Steelers uh, weren't at their full power without Big Ben. And not only that, that was our strike one their mindset going into it. Strike two was the early reports from the Texans um, that they were going to rest a bunch of their people, which we needed them to win. And they wound up resting pretty much everybody. They had A.J. McCarron starting instead of Deshaun Watson. Um, DeAndre Hopkins didn't play, but he was active. And then they inactivated a lot of their key starters, Bradley Roby, Jacob Martin, Will Fuller the fifth. Uh, Kenny Stills, one of their main linebackers, Benardrick McKinney, and even their stud defensive lineman, DJ Reader. So they were still playing the win. They did look impressive. AJ McCarron looked pretty good for a backup, and and they they were in that game um, up into the second half. And but that was strike two, and then strike three was a mixture of weather conditions as the rain started really falling, and us just not looking uh, to be in the same class or have the caliber of of offensive weapons to keep up with the Ravens. And not only that, but um, Mr. Our, uh, Jordan Berry, our punter, I, I hope that may be the final time we see him in a Steelers uniform. I know it's kind of critical. As early in the year, he's, he was playing quite well, but some mishandled snaps, and they led to directly to points. And then you just can't have that when you have a quarterback like Duck Hodges uh, as your only option being that Rudolph went out. And the storyline that we had with him was one of the great great things this year. Uh, but he was only 9-25. Um, he had a fumble that led directly to points. And really the only highlight of that game was seeing Benny Snell run hard. He had 91 yards, averaged over 5 yards a rush and a touchdown. And our defense still showed up, even though we did wind up losing uh, considerably to the Ravens. So you can still hang your hat on that defense. Um, it was a great season by a lot, a lot of key contributors and making names for themselves. The Steven Nelsons, the the Fitzpatrick coming over, Devin Bush really coming into his own, and Cam Hayward continually playing at a high level. Javon Hargrave playing well for us while we have him, um, and it's it's not going to probably be for a long time here, uh, Steeler Nation. So 
that's really just my quick recap of what really was a downer. And, and I don't want to say I told you so, but I could kind of see it with the Ravens really, you know, taking account and where they want to be, even though they did lose in the playoffs, they, they meant business, even with the backups. So tip of the cap to them. Uh, but we're on to the off season here now, Steeler Nation. But we're going to end with one more thing um, in our prelude here. And it was something that I dived into in the sermon series earlier. I believe it was my first uh, episode here. And that's our superlatives. Uh, we did a mid-season superlatives. And I'm going to go ahead and we're going to revisit this for an end of the year one, just to give out some honors and some awards to those that really deserve it and some recognition. So the first one was our breakout player of the year or the breakout guy. Mid-season, I selected Matt Filer because the amount of uh, high-quality football he put on tape. Um, I think there's really only one guy that we're going to say is the breakout performer, um, and that's Mr. Bud Dupree. 11 and a half sacks. It's a career high. 16 tackles for loss and four forced fumbles, just to name a couple key stats. He really was a monster in the run game, that true bookend, and it happened in his um, – free agent year is walk year and it's going to be tough for us to um, maintain him on our roster but he is definitely our breakout player of the year um, congratulations bud uh, we'll get into uh, later on here about some of the free agency questions we have going on as we start some of our offseason uh, series here next superlative was the comeback kid of the year uh, mid-season was chris boswell end of the season i'm rolling with him again boswell Man, for the questions you had coming into the season, you really put that to bed quickly. You were 29 of 31 on field goals. One of them was a mishandled snap by Jordan Berry. Again, you can see a theme. I might, <laughs> We might want to be looking for a different punter uh, come 2020. Uh, but he was 29 of 31 on field goals, and he was perfect 28 of 28 on point after attempts. So easily, so easy selection for me, Chris Boswell. Um, really went from not sure to back to being the hammer and consistent kicker that we all know and love. Now, our next one was the rising star. And midseason, it went to Deontay Johnson. And I'm going to continue this trend. He's our end of the season uh, rising star. This guy was a monster. Um, he was named to the second team all pro as a return man. He is a terrific um in space player and not only that his route running is great um, the tendencies and the small nuances that he can do with head fakes and and hand checks and his quick footwork off the line of scrimmage is just you don't see that out of a, a young receiver coming into the nfl he wound up leading all nfl rookies with 59 catches on the year and he actually led the nfl if i'm not misquoting this from mr uh, nick Farabaugh, uh, who is a, a big Steeler guy and, and another uh, one of our quality people in Steeler Nation, he had 2.34 yards of separation per target, and that led the NFL. So that tells you he's really able to get open in the in the whole aspect of a route, and that's the kind of stuff you always seen from Antonio Brown, and that was the skill set you always seen um, after we, we drafted him from Toledo. And it's, it's exciting seeing it to go into year two, and especially with Big Ben to be able to work with him next year that he's really going to be that guy we want to be looking for next year to take on the cap of number one receiver and getting back Juju healthy and continual growth from Washington. So we're really in good shape there um, in receiver, but he's our, our rising star is Deontay Johnson. Next is our biggest disappointment. Um, at the midseason, I, I mentioned and, and elected Stephon to it just because of his injury. He was playing at an all-pro level, and the real big disappointment is we didn't get to see him the rest of the year. And as dominant as our defense was now that we've seen with the Watts and the Duprees and Haywards and even Hargrave and Fitzpatrick and Hayden really came on at the end of the year and Steven Nelson played quality football, who would have been able to get a wrap their mind around the amount of stats we could have had with Hayward and to it both bringing pressure um, interior? That, that would have been sick, uh, but we didn't get to see it so our end of the year, a lot of people want me to say Juju Smith-Schuster. I'm really going to give him a pass this year with injury and just becoming frustrated and not being able to get back 100%. Um, I want to see what he if he can bounce back at the beginning of next year, but I'm going to give him a pass right here, Steeler Nation. And my guy is Vance McNaught. Um, yes, he missed a game. I believe it was a game or two with injury, but he just never looked like himself. And maybe I should come to expect that because he was really inconsistent coming from San Francisco. 
Um, he looked like a, a Pro Bowl caliber tight end when Ben was on the field. And I know the inexperience at the quarterback position has some to do with the amount of, um, you know, real production lost out of that position. But he was one when he was on the field, he was one of the best targets, especially run after the catch. And you just didn't see that explosiveness and that power after. And really, even on blocking downs, you could tell he almost seemed checked out um, about half, that he wasn't, I don't want to say giving full effort, but he just was frustrated within his role. He, he was frustrated with how the season was going. And I'm really disappointed. He only had 38 catches. He only had a measly 273 yards average, just over seven yards catch and only three touchdowns. And that's a position really in our offense um, back when we had Heath Miller, and I know he's he's one of the franchise greats and one of the really unheralded tight ends in, in all NFL history, but that's not good enough production. And I know Vinette came over midseason, and he he may get a bigger opportunity if he resigns with us. But McDonald, I'm I'm really disappointed in your effort, especially as a tight end position is usually the best friend of of inexperienced uh, quarterbacks, and it's just it was disappointing to see that effort of McDonald all year. So next up is our rookie of the year was Devin Bush, and this is a shoe, and he is our end of the season rookie of the year. Um, he had 109 tackles total, 72 of them solo. He had nine tackles for loss, a sack, two interceptions, a forced fumble. He recovered four of those forced uh, fumble recoveries, returned one for a touchdown, and even had four pass defense. So th- he was just a monster. He was well worth the trade up, and I'd love to see what he's going to do next year. He's another guy with Deontay Johnson. We really hit a home run with a lot of our picks this past season in the draft. Um, Even with the trade up and what we had to give up, I would do it again. Uh, Just had that athleticism and that growth that we're going to see in year two for him. So he's our rookie of the year is Devin Bush. Next uh, up was our under the radar hero. Our mid-season guy was Steven Nelson, and he had a real uh, serious case here to take it for the end of the year. Um, but I don't know if I can really give this to him, but I'm going to just because it always seems to, that he's never in the main topic and made headline whenever people talk about interior defensive linemen. That's Cam Hayward, our captain on defense. He had 83 tackles total in, from the interior, which is insane. 51 of them solo. He had nine sacks quietly on the season, 11 tackles for loss. He hit the quarterback 22 times. He forced a uh, fumble and he also recovered one and he batted down six passes. He was named to the All-Pro, uh, first-team All-Pro, and also a Pro Bowler, so that's what I'm saying. I don't know if I can really say unsung, but I'm saying in the mass media, Cam Hayward doesn't get the love he should because this guy is an animal. His power is simply overwhelming from an interior spot and just absolutely uh, great presence, and I hope that he gets an extension done that we can see him retire a Pittsburgh Steeler. He is a great man off the field and in that locker room. Um, wouldn't want to replace him uh, anytime soon. So those are our under-the-radar hero. And our final one comes down to MVP. Uh, The Steelers voted um, T.J. Watt the MVP, and it really came down to two guys the same way as it was in midseason. And it was between the acquisition of Minka Fitzpatrick, our free safety, and Mr. T.J. Watt. I don't see how you can name anybody on the offense a uh, MVP in this season because our defense was so dominant. And just to make the case a little bit for Fitzpatrick, um, another gentleman, Alex Kazora um, from, I believe it's Steelers Depot, who does good work for Steelers Nation to check him out. He had a couple of stats here to drop that kind of make the case for Minka. Um, After recording four interceptions in six games, uh, basically teams went away from Fitzpatrick. He was only targeted just twice over his final eight weeks um, of the season. Um, and it was the definition of basically a no-fly zone. Uh, so that was outstanding. And even quarterback ratings when targeted in 2019, um, Fitzpatrick only allowed a 53.7 rating. So that's outstanding work for Fitzpatrick. And that's at a midseason acquisition or an early to midseason acquisition. It's hard to say what type of growth we're going to see for him next year. And that's exciting times for us. But our MVP, and it's only one guy, the guy always stepped up and we needed to play, Mr. T.J. Watt. You can see I'm wearing his jersey here, and I'm going to be standing on that table, pounding on it, hoping that he gets Defensive Player of the Year um, for the entire NFL. I know there's another other couple guys, Stephen Gilmore, we already talked about, Chandler Jones, some others uh, in a previous episode. But really, if you're talking about the most important defensive player for any team, Watt was that guy. When we needed a play this year, he came up big, whether it was in run stop, stripping the football, getting a big sack, um, even coming up with an interception in the red zone a few times. It was just outstanding work, 
And not only that, I got to give a tip of the cap for the Steelers um, and Tomlin and the defensive coordinator and Keith Butler, uh, Alex Kazora, as I met before, uh, or I mentioned before, he also put out a stat about how the Steelers have changed their mindset, um, especially because they were able to have a Mark Barron, even though he did get roasted a few times um, in pass coverage, having that uh, athleticism at that second level. Uh, gave them the opportunity to utilize their outside linebackers in attack mode rather than dropping back. So their rates of drop, uh, the dropping and coverage to actually rushing the passer. In 2018, Watt was being utilized almost, it was just over 19% of the time dropping back. So you think about it, a fifth of the time almost, he's dropping back. You don't want that out of TJ Watt. So this year you can see the usage was 9.1%. So he's getting more opportunities to get after the pass rusher, more opportunities to strip the football, and more opportunities to come screaming downhill and making an impact. So tip of the cap to the um, Kazora for giving me the stats to back that up, but also just the defense as a whole, uh, recognizing what the strengths and weakness are and utilizing them. So TJ Watt, God bless you, and let's keep seeing that growth as we see you hopefully retire as a uh, Pittsburgh Steeler one day. So that really wraps up our preload session. Um, this whole episodes, as we go into the offseason, are going to get shorter. Uh, Steeler Nation, as you're watching this, uh, I do apologize for that, but it's really we don't have game previews or anything. So I'm just going to try to give you the most in-depth stuff I can as we start to get in here. And we're going to transition right into our sermon session here. Since the season concluded, um, and the playoffs are in full bore now. And, and for me in Blitzalytics, I've been really taking a prominent step in the scouting department this year. Um, I'm actually headed to Mobile here pretty directly at the end of the week and going to be taking a live look at some of these prospects. So I'm going to be jumping in on them at a later point in a later episode to try to maybe find some matches for us uh, and our needs, what we're going to be going here. But just to kick off the offseason uh, series, I want to give you guys a glance at who the restricted or excuse me, the free agents that we are that we have at hand. And we're going to go through unrestricted free agents, which we have no uh, rights to really retain them outside of a tag. Um, restricted free agents, which we have to give them a tender and exclusive rights free agents who really it's basically you just have to sign back with us. That's, that's the easiest way to describe for for all you guys. And I'm also going to give you a little bit of percentages of, of chance to return. So we're going to jump right in here. Currently, though, I want to give you guys is the cap space per uh, over the cap, which is a great resource if you're a fan and want to kind of play around and see what could happen with the salary cap and who we can maybe acquire and not just give you know a random name out of left field that we couldn't fit them in the cap. It really gives you that option and it has a calculator function on there. And those guys are great people over there. Um, you know, Jason Fitzgerald, I believe, and you know, just a great bunch of guys. Zach Moore is another one. Um, know him personally. They do great work and and really reference their stuff if you got to get into it. But as right now, Over the Cap has our cap space at only $1.43 million and some change. That is not a lot uh, whatsoever. That's not even enough to sign the rookie class that we'll be drafting here and the undrafted players. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, the one outlier here is with the CBA up, if they do not um, ratify a new one and agree to one, there is no ability to really restructure or push uh, numbers off into the future. So it really limits your exposure on what you can do and the way you can structure contracts going forward. So that's another uh, real break to our offseason that we, we hope as Steeler fans, you want to see that CBA agreed to and ratified to just kind of be able to have us more flexibility in our in our cap situation going forward and i know omar khan and them guys kevin colbert they're great at you know working the system and and getting every dollar out that they can so you don't really need to worry about too much just know that there is some some extra pressing issues to that number so it's so small we got to really look at these guys so unrestricted free agents we all know the big one and that's mr bud dupree the outside linebacker um ed drusher i'm actually going to put his odds at 90 percent coming back I don't see them letting him go. I know Tomlin already spoke on it as being a priority that they keep him. Um, I'm not so sure that they're going to sign him long term unless it would be at somewhat a discount. He's probably it, it, we're going to be placing the franchise tag on him uh, to just automatically keep him for this one year, and that'll be at 16.266 million, and that will be automatically um, having to be equated for this year's salary cap. So you can see 
We only have a little over a million. He's automatically, if we slap that franchise tag, 16.266 million. That's a lot of meat that needs to be made out of nowhere. You're going to have to wave that magic wand and make it happen. But uh, I know these guys in our front office can make it happen, and they don't want to lose a guy like that. So I'm putting it at 90%. The only reason I don't make it 100 is that for some reason that the agent would relay uh, from Bud that's saying that he wouldn't sign it and basically throw a fit a la Le'Veon Bell, not report. But uh, by all standards and all accounts from what I've heard, uh, Bud Dupree said he wouldn't mind playing on the one-year tag. Um, he'd be getting his money up front, so he's not going to really be upset. He's already said he wouldn't mind playing for Pittsburgh on the tag. So by all accounts, hopefully that's you know thumbs up that we get to see that tandem of Waddle one side, Dupree on another. And he's an excellent run defender. So he's he's not just a one-trick pony as a pass rusher and really seemed to come into his own. And hopefully that player we seen last year is who we'll see going forward. Um, kind of similar a career arc as his ex-teammate at Kentucky who signed a big year, big deal with Green Bay, Mr. Zadarius Smith. Hopefully we continue to see that epic rise and not not no fall. So, but 90%, and we're going to automatically have to look at that 16 over $16 million cap hit. So we're going to keep Dupree, but the rest of these guys are going to be real questions. The next big unrestricted free agent is Javon Hargrave, the grave digger. Um, played absolutely wonderful football. After two, it went down. We got to see him play more snaps, and they were quality snaps. He got to rush the pass or some, and that guy's going to cash in. It's not going to be with us. Um, I'm going to go back to a comment that Tomlin dropped in one of his press conferences. Um, he referenced the nose tackle position, which is his, you know, in, in the base defense, that's what Hargrave is, although he showed more uh, versatility, being able to play some nickel and dime pass rusher on, along the interior. He said the nose tackle position in this day and age is like a blockbuster video. And if we all know anything about TV and video right now, there ain't a lot of uh, movie rental places left because of Netflix and stuff like that. So, that's going to be a really devalued position. And I'm actually more keen on the idea of we're probably going to see a reimagined vision for our defensive lineman going forward because of the success we've seen this year. And if we do go to base, it's going to probably go more towards three defensive ends than an actual, um, you know, force fitting a nose tackle, a two down run stuff. Or if so, it's going to be a late round draft pick, undrafted free agent that that's what they're good at. Don't really do a lot as a pass rusher and only be a two-down player. Uh, or we're going to see, as I said, more of a defensive end, you know, three, five techniques on the field at one time um, and letting our linebackers make plays. So, Because they only get used a, a small portion of the time now because we're our base defense is basically nickel because we play it, I believe, 40-some percent of the time and base is like 15 to 20 percent. So you're not in that a lot. It, with the exception of playing maybe the Ravens twice a year because of their rushing um, offense. So you're going to need a guy like that in the stable, but that's not saying you're going to pay big money to Hargrave, especially when you invested on to it and Hayward's up for a new deal. We're not going to be letting him go anytime soon with his level of play still staying up there quite high. Um, so I only put his chance of returning at 10% in the event. Maybe he'd give a hometown discount because he did speak about he loves Pittsburgh. This is where he was first given a chance to really show off his skill set. But I, he's not going to be leaving that money on the table. He's going to go elsewhere where he he's going to get it, and he's going to be a well-deserved uh, player that's going to play well for another team. Next up, and that's B.J. Finney, the center and guard. Um, he, he's played well for us. We've won the majority of the games that he's ever started for us. He's a key member, uh, being able to fill in that crack if Pouncey misses games. And that's going to be, you know, kind of a step back if we do lose him. And I, this is a real toss-up. I've actually put it at 40% chance that he's coming back just because um, versatile inside interior offensive linemen who are quality, and he is a high-quality interior offensive lineman, um, will get paid to be starters elsewhere. And you see other teams that could utilize a center or a guard, and he kind of rose above the knocks on him having short arms because of the, his intellect and, and ability to just really make the most out of the parts he has. And I think he's actually going to leave. And this one's why I say it's such a toss-up is if you've seen him when he signed the undrafted free agent deal with us coming out of Kansas State, he absolutely um, lost it and bawled his eyes out because he loves the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, his uh, The majority of his family are, are Pittsburgh Steelers. So 
if he would do something team friendly and cap friendly, uh, I might put those odds at maybe 60, 40 and seeing an opportunity maybe to go for a left guard starting position, as we'll talk here in a couple minutes, you know, maybe that could entice him back even a little more uh, than the money because it's his favorite team. But I really think that he's going to chase the money too and, and get a bigger deal starting somewhere else in a three, four year clip. Um, as much as that, I hate to see that because I love his skill set and that depth, that quality experience depth along our offensive line. Next guy up is Nick Bennett, the tight end we acquired for a fifth round pick for Seattle. Um, the Steelers were said to be chasing after him for a number of years um, from the, the year he was drafted. They kept asking Seattle if they'd be interested in getting rid of him, and they finally broke down and traded for him. And he didn't you know, show a lot in the passing game. He never really has. He does have that ability, though, if he's given the opportunity. Um, he stepped up quite nice in the blocking department um, as, on wham blocks and coming across formation. He, he showed pretty well there. And I think he's actually the one guy out of these first couple people that I think they're going to make a priority behind Bud um, just because his number isn't going to be so high because he hasn't shown uh, the pass-catching skills and numbers aren't there. Um, he's still a young guy. I believe he's 26 years old. He does have good measurables. And you might see some growth out of him if he gets to play with Big Ben next year. And that blocking, uh, that blocking ability really puts his priority, I think, a little higher. So I think that's a 75% chance we're going to see him come back for a mid, mid-market mid deal, less than what Jesse James probably got last year with the Lions, hopefully, because that was a lot of money. But he's going to be our 1B2 uh, tight end, and he's going to be a quality uh, person there. And we'll get into the whole tight end position here in a second by some of the other players on this list. Sean Davis, the safety that started for a number of years with us, former second round pick. Um, he hurt his shoulder. I'm putting a 0% chance on him coming back because he already spoke about not wanting to take a one year prove it deal. We don't have a starting spot for him. Um, he is an athlete. Um, he, he puts out great measurable numbers, 40 yard dash times and whatnot like that. Never seen the production on the field like we did with Minka. So 0% chance. Thank you for your efforts here. But he's going to probably get a flyer from another team uh, because of his starting experience. And he could be somebody that could uh, maybe sign a, a little bit more surprising deal than what you think and maybe fetch us a nice compensatory pick. And that's the one thing you got to keep in mind here, um, Steeler Nation, is that a lot of these guys, if they go away from the Steelers, Yes, it's going to hurt, but we have a great ability to develop depth behind and let them players rise up the depth chart and become good quality starters. And those guys that leave give us a better opportunity at getting a compensatory pick for 2021 draft. And Hargrave would definitely, um, he'll get a nice chunk of change if he leaves, which that'll really put us high in the equation. I'm not going to say a third round pick, but maybe a fourth or fifth. Um, Finney as well might get us a fourth or fifth if he gets enough money. And some of these other guys might be in that seventh range. The Sean Davis is down here that we're going to talk about. Uh, next guy was a former first-round pick that we declined the fifth-year option. That's Artie Burns. Um, got to really tip the cap to him, the way he really showed up this year and played hard on special teams, even though he didn't get a lot of snaps as a corner. He did get one start there and really give him uh, another opportunity, another place, in a place that really plays a lot of man rather than zone, which would be utilized to his strengths. He might be somebody that's surprised with another team and, and maybe get a starting spot because he does have good speed and good measurables there and length. So 0% chance for Artie coming back. Next guy up is Mr. Tyler Matakavich, um, the heart and soul of our special teams. And Dirty Red, as a lot of people call him, he was uh, in Pro Bowl mentioning, and, and he's a force on special teams, always up there in the NFL lead in tackles. Um, I know he blocked a few punts. Just a great guy. He gets the most out of what he has. And I'm putting, I think they're going to make him a priority as well. Although Mr. Robert Spillane had played quite well down the stretch in special teams work. If, if Matt Cabbage's numbers get too high, they'll just simply say thank you for what you did and roll with Spillane as their guy and uh, stud on, on special teams here. But I think they're going to give him an opportunity to come back. It's really going to be for backup money, um, just above what the league minimum is, maybe a two to three year deal, um, just maybe over that million, maybe a million and a half, um, because we do need some quality special team play there. And he is one of our captains in that department. So 75% chance that they get something done with him. The next guy is Cameron Kennedy, the, the long snapper. Um, he's been pretty, pretty good as a snapper for us. He hasn't really had a lot um, off target throws and off target snaps. 
So I'm going to put the the return rate at about 90% for him just because he's been rock solid unless they would happen to get a more established veteran that they want to bring in. Also, um, the uncertainty that there has been no announcements if there's any coaching changes, which if Danny Smith leaves, maybe that brings in a different, you know, person with perspective. They want to go after somebody else. So I'm going to put about 90% there. Um, unless a coaching change, then it might change to about a 75% chance. The next guy was LT Walton, the defensive end, was also an unrestricted free agent. He got injured and put on um, injured reserve, and he basically uh, he was only brought in for depth to begin with. So I'm not gonna I, I don't think he's gonna be back at all. Zero percent chance. Um, he could come back at just as uh, training camp uh, body, but we'll see what happens over the off season. And some of the other guys. Next up now, uh, that was all the unrestricted free agents. So those are the ones we have no control over outside of maybe placing a tag on them, a transition or franchise tag. As I said, I think what Dupree is going to get, but I don't think they'll be able to hammer out a long-term deal because of the looming contracts having to come up for the Haywards, um, Villanueva, as well as uh, TJ Watt. Um, they'll exercise his fifth-year uh, option this year. But next offseason, we're going to have to get him a absolute monster contract. And I believe they're going to give it to him because of the hard work and the type of leader he has really established himself on that defense. You're looking at probably a $20 million contract right there. So if we have Big Ben at 30-some, Watt at 20, that's not a lot of money to go around. That's why I say Dupree will probably be the franchise tag unless he would give somewhat of a hometown discount um, in the long range over a three- to four-year deal. I don't see them a lot in that money there when they know they're going to have to spend so much with Watt because I do not believe they're going to let him get away. And also a Juju Smith-Schuster uh, extension is going to have to be on the horizon because he'll be an open free agent next year um, in 2021. So either they're going to give him one this year or by the end of training camp, uh, in this offseason or training camp, once he proves he's healthy and what we'll to see those numbers. But his numbers from his first few seasons – um, that'll be a heavy number too, probably 15 plus million, if not 12 to 15, maybe even more than that for Juju. So you're going to have a lot of big contracts coming up. And as you've seen, we only have a little over $1 million in our cap now. And we're going to have to wave that magic wand, as I said, And but you can't be um, allotting too much money in the future to sign these other guys. Um, because the last time I checked, uh, the 2021 cap, it's not accounting for you know growth and what the new CBA will say. But we're around 60 million, 60, maybe 70 million, um, just under that 70 million mark in cap. And I know everybody's like, oh, that's a lot of cap space. Not really when you're thinking about the TJ Watt contract that's coming, Juju, Cam Hayward, Villanueva. If you're looking at these guys, they're going to be getting re up. That's going to be a big portion. You're probably going to be looking about 15 to 20 million after all is said and done. So you really got to take a big, broad approach when you're looking at free agency um, from year to year. But to jump into our restricted free agents, guys and girls, as Steeler Nation, the first one up is Mr. Matt Filer. He played amazing this year at right tackle. Um, I actually think in the long-term plans, we're going to see what happened uh, in the Rams game. Their long-term plans, we're going to give him the second round tender, um, which is, I believe is a little bit over $3 million. So there's another big hefty number, but they're not going to let him go. Um, they're going to float the second round tender on him, which restricted free agency, you give guys tenders. That way, if another team um, values them and they want to sign them like they are an unrestricted free agent, and it gives you the opportunity to match the contract that what they'll have to sign them long term, or if you let them go, basically, you'll get that team's uh, pick for that year. So if another team would want to sign Filer, in this case, they would have to give us our second round pick, which would be a good deal. But that also deters people because teams don't like giving up draft capital if they have to. So He's going to be a 100% chance of return unless a team swoops in and gives him a big market deal that we just simply cannot match. So I think he's our long-term plan at the left guard position, and we're going to see that lineup of the Rams where a core of four and another player to restrictive free agent here might be battling out for right tackle. So Matt Filer, left guard at 100% chance of return. Mike Hilton, our nickelback, who played outstanding this year and has put just two straight seasons of outstanding work as a run defender and a blitzer off the edge, as well as making some key stops in pass defense this year. I'm putting him at a 75% chance of return at a second round tender. And the only reason I put a second round tender and 75% instead of 90 or hundred is because we have Cam Sutton in the background looking, saying I'm, I played some quality snaps 
at slot corner, slot corner this year. Took up more of a role in dime once Cam Kelly kind of took a back seat and then was released. Um, if we don't have enough money to go around, although Mike Hilton has said numerous times that he wants to be a Pittsburgh Steeler going forward, he's going to be a guy I think we're going to give a long-term deal to. And I don't think it's going to be market-breaking, but I think it's going to be quality money because he is a really valued asset in run defense out of their nickel package. So 75% there only for the reason of another team swooping in and that presence of Cam, Cam Sutton there. Um, so that's another 3.2 some million we got to account for. Our second to last uh, restricted free agent is Mr. Zach Banner, the cult hero from our, our tight end days this, this year, um, getting after Duck for not throwing him a pass. Um, I'm giving him an 80% chance of return, and that's only because we're going to give him an original round tender which means that it'll be less money. I believe it'll be like around 1.4 or 1.3 million. And the only reason I say they give him that is that they can save a little money rather than the two, second round tender. And he was. it also goes back to his original draft selection, which was a fourth round selection for the Indianapolis Colts uh, when he came out. So it'll be less money, but we'll also get a quality pick if somebody would try to sign him. And I think the front office and the coaching staff really has a role for him going forward. He was the one that made uh, Core 4 inactive this this year because of his work off the, off the field throughout the offseason, dropping that weight. I believe it was 80 pounds. He looked great in training camp, uh, improved his foot quickness. And I'm really intrigued to maybe see him go from, you know, that, that third tight end to maybe being our starting right tackle next year. And it might be one of them facts that you just is, is a great pickup from our front office. And the only reason that I say 80% is somebody might swoop in and give you that fourth round pick because they've seen, you know, his renewed sense of dropping weight and his ability uh, playing at third tight end. So 80% for him. Next up is Jordan Dangerfield, um, more of a reserve safety, didn't get a lot of snaps this year, but one of our key contributors in the special teams. And that's a, that's a, you know, that's a hard game to play here. And I'm actually putting him as a 50% chance of return, but with the saying of it will not be on a tender from the restricted free agent side. Um, 1.35, 1.5, if it's original, um, he was an undrafted free agent. That means another team can sign him for that amount without even having to give us any compensation other than a chance to match. I think they'll basically non-tender him in, in, in a sorts and then try to sign him back at a lower deal um, after that. So I think it's really 50-50 because he does have a lot of experience with us. He knows the playbook. And with a lot of uh, questions on depth outside of our starting safeties, he might be a good guy to have in tow. It just will not be on that restricted free agent uh, front. Next up are exclusive rights free agents. They basically have no right to sign with another team outside of us. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on them. They already re-signed Marcus Allen, the safety, and my man Tuzar Skipper, who I think is going to have a big role going forward. Um, outside of maybe Dupree leaving this year, but I think he's somebody in their plans. They re-signed him to a two-year deal. He was an exclusive rights free agent. Um, but we only have two guys left, and that's J.C. Hassenauer, uh, the, the, excuse me, the center who came from the AAF in Birmingham Iron, also former Alabama Roll Tide. He plays center guard, more of a center, though, all of his career in college. Um, it's going to be a 100% chance he's coming back because of the Finney leaving. At least he's somebody that's already been in the playbook. He might not make the roster, but he's somebody with um, experience and in, in, in the building already. So he's 100%. The only other one was LeVon Hooks, a reserve defensive lineman that's um, been on our practice squad a few years and has really um, played well when given the opportunity in preseason. But he has just uh, had injury problems. He was put on IR this year, and they're not going to bring him back unless it's it's for bare bones. So I don't see him returning. So just pretty much Hassenauer for the exclusive rights-free agents. Then the last two that we're going to give here, and the first one is a contract option that's being held right now. That's Vance McDonald. We talked about him. He's one of my biggest disappointments. Um, they can pick up uh, $5.672 million or something like that and change if they release him. He carries over a $7 million cap hit as it is now. And his production, as I said here earlier, is, is not worth that, especially that with his injury history. I believe that they're going to be getting rid of him, uh, dropping the option and taking up the uh, contract space there that we can get and use that cap space for Bud Dupree going forward. So only a 10% chance of him returning, and that's only for the chance of where he would renegotiate his contract and want to come back at a way, way reduced number. I do not see Vance McDonald, the Matamol, coming back. 
final portion here, and it's it's how we're going to wave that magic wand and, and bring some more cap space. We're going to look at cap casualties here quick. The first one up, and this one's going to be hard because he's a leader in our offensive line, Ramon Foster, the left guard. Um, his play kind of fell off this year. Um, and we have other guys in tow, as I said, Filer and even Finney, if we give him a chance to be re-signed. Um, we, we cut Foster, we save $4 million, and we only have $1.455 million in dead. So that's not a lot. Usually anything under $2 million in dead space, that's really something that they'll eat up quickly if it's a big number for cap space savings. $4 million, uh, chance of returning there for him. I'm saying 1%. And I'm more likely we're looking at him either being released or maybe retiring before that fact. Um, next guy up, Mark Barron. As I said, he kind of took a beating around here, but he did give them the opportunity to rush the passer more by having some more athleticism. Um, he has a $5.25 million savings if we release him at just under um, $3 million in dead hit. But they're going to eat that to be able to get the five and a half, five and a quarter million dollar savings especially try to reallot that five and a quarter over to Dupree. Uh, I really only see him get an opportunity similar to Foster, maybe a 10% if he would restructure down to a basically just barely over league minimum deal um, to stay with us. But I think it's going to be another off season where he gets cut by a team. Next up is Anthony Ciccolo. And this one was real head scratcher when they even signed him to a big, big deal. Um, it was basically just a sign away from new England He's been nothing more than a special teams presence with us and, and a rotational outside linebacker, not a good one at that. Um, he had some off the field issues, even though that was tossed away uh, from the courts. But he, you can get $5 million by cutting him and just barely over a million dollar dead. He is not coming back unless he's re-signed right before training camp at a bare minimum deal. Uh, we're going to eat that $5 million up and give it to Dupree right away. The next two guys. Uh, the first one is is Jordan Berry. As I said, the last part of the season, I'm sorry, that was a death knell for me. I, I want to see, even a rookie that at now, I want to see him punting. Um, his consistency went out the window. Poor field conditions really contributed to a lot. I don't want him on the team. And he gives you almost $2 million cap space, 1.8. The final guy is is the shade tree, Daniel McCullers. Um, it's 0% chance of him coming back, especially when you can get a million and a half cap space by cutting him. So that's just a real... You know, kind of in-depth, but kind of a quick overview of what free agency looks like, the unrestricted, restricted, exclusive rights, and then maybe some cap casualties and the option um, that's out there and odds of coming back and forth. And we'll get more in-depth on, on the draft and, and maybe free agent targets for us in free agency with the limited cap space um, as we get into further sessions uh, in, in this video series. So finally, we're going to wrap up with our trivia question. Uh, the last time we were in our video here, our trivia question was, this week, Steeler Nation celebrated a very special birthday on December 27th. Um, it was actually the 44th birthday, to be exact. What was so special about that date? Dayton, December 27th, 1975. It was none other than the invention of the terrible towel, um, one of the most iconic gimmicks in all sports. Um, and it was invented by none other than the great um, announcer, Myron Cope. So that was the invention of the terrible towel. Um, this week's trivia and for the next episode will be Bill Cower uh, got the call for the Hall of Fame the other day uh, on the playoff pregame show, and he's going to be enshrined, and it's going to be a great feeling to see Coach Cower in, in the Hall of Fame. But what was his career record as a head coach in the NFL? So that's a pretty easy one. What was his career record in the NFL, Mr. Bill Cower? So that ends our show, um, the ninth episode here. Um, we're almost to double digits. Uh, we're getting into the off season. As I said before in my last episode, these are going to get more sparse in between. Being it's the off season, we don't have game previews. We're going to jump into some targets, as I said, maybe some draft prospects to identify for us. But um, as of right now, keep tabs on blitzlytics.com for XFL stuff that's coming out, XFL coverage. The games are going to be starting here right after the Super Bowl, as well as scouting reports. As I said, I'm doing a deep dive. I'm actually going to Mobile, Alabama for the Senior Bowl this coming week. So keep tabs on at Preacher Boy Roy, the Twitter account, and Blitzalytics.com. And you might be getting some updates to some of the players going forward here. And we all know, if you want to get in touch, at Preacher Boy Roy, at Steel City Sermon, and how I always end my shows, stay humble. Be a blessing. Pittsburgh Steelers. Pittsburgh do this all the time. I've been playing them for 13 years. When you avoid the middle, they go into the middle. It's never changed. Like a yellow, like a yellow, like a yellow, like a yellow.